These two gentlemen are here tonight to talk about their books and uh, a little bit about the game of golf. We're glad you came out to hear them. Please welcome Todd Santel and Bob Cup. I guess I could start this out to talk about Todd. <laughs> I made it a point to make sure that we passed 18 holes together before we came down here. And my father used to say, you can tell more about a person in 18 holes of golf than you can by being with them for a year. <laughs> so I can tell you without any res reservations whatsoever, Todd Sentel is a happy, enjoyable, and imaginative person based on the golf shots that I saw him hit today. <laughs> <laughs> We did have a great time, and he, it turns out, we have similar approach to the game. And if nothing else, uh, I would like to be able to pass on to you that the game of golf is about fun. And unfortunately, it seems to have taken on a different aura than that. But if you keep in mind both of these books, different as they may be, Fun is the intent of the game. That's why it was invented, and it is eventually what happened to Wayman Poodle. <laughs> so, if nothing else, golf is not about as, as, uh, La, La Junta, was that her name? La Juanita. La Juanita. La Juanita, just let it roll off the tongue. Don't La Juanita, uh, she always made reference to the Hootsie Tootsie <laughs> country clubs, and, uh, this is not about Hootsie Tootsie Country Clubs. This is about enjoying the game of golf, watching the ball fly against the blue sky and bounce on the ground and roll on the greens, and that's fun. And for people who don't play golf, you should read Todd's book because if you ever want to get a feeling for the passion that exists in human beings about playing golf, <laughs> it's certainly there. <laughs> And I enjoyed it immensely. It was great fun. So, Well, thank you, Bob. And it was a, just a wonderful pleasure. And it was his idea. He got to it first, darn it. He <laughs> said, you know, I think that before we enjoy our evening at the Georgia Center of the Book that we should play golf together. And he even proposed that day. I'm thinking, wow, that's, gonna, that's packing in a lot. That's, that's, that's wonderful. And I was flattered. Uh, I did learn one thing about Bob today. And I'll share with you. Uh, the drink cart girl would come by and, you know, we had lunch together. His account number at Setting Down Creek Golf Club <laughs> is 55. Five, and then he would cough. He would cough. And then the other three digits were delivered kind of like this. And the waiters and waitresses are scrambling to get that. But what a, what a wonderful idea for, God forbid, two men to go out and play golf and get to know each other. And... I, I guess i got to share something else about Bob. This, it's just so obnoxious. The whole day he talked about his wife. Pam this. Oh, Pam that. Pam loves me because I do. Pam loves And then here she is tonight. Let's have a, a big hand for Pam Coe. <laughs> Who, I think people are fascinated, uh, and, and you're, uh, I'm sure you've seen this before. They're fascinated on why and who you have dedicated your book to. And Bob dedicated his book to his lovely wife. And uh, his description of why he did and, uh, and how she helps him as a wifely editor and critiquer uh, really is extremely heartwarming. And uh, I, I really honor them both for that because that could, that's like wallpapering bathrooms together. You know, it can lead to a strengthening of the marriage or a death of both people. But thank you to Bill Starr and Joe Davich for having us here. I'd like to say very quickly and recognize someone else in the audience. The last time that I was here, I was here to learn more about a person uh, who influenced, uh, and many of y'all are here tonight to learn about the writing life perhaps and the, the process of writing and you know how it gets done. Uh, and you're sitting on your ass the whole time typing. That's pretty much how it gets done. But... <laughs> I was here because of my love for Flannery O'Connor and how her work influenced me. And I would have to say, without 
gushing too much and getting too misty-eyed, which I'm capable of doing, change my whole thinking uh, in a singular moment my 12th grade year. Uh, but the last time I was in this room, I was, uh, actually, it was full. Congratulations. I was standing back there by the camera, bumping into it the whole night for Craig Amundsen, the executive director of the Andalusia Foundation. And I would love for you all to give a good hand to Craig and his friend Amy, who is here with him tonight. Drove all the way up from Baldwin County, Georgia, from, well, you probably left the office at, at Andalusia. Uh, and I was here the last time in this room to, to hear him speak. And the, the, I'm profoundly affected by the work that he is doing in preserving Andalusia, uh, where she lived and wrote with her mom, and what will happen in the future. And I'm telling you, congratulations. I'd just like to recognize you being here. I get, Bob and I play golf, and I get in, refresh my email, and there's an email. I'm coming up with a friend from, I'm thinking, wow, that's just... There are more important things to do. Now, maybe to see Bob, but, you know, God, I couldn't believe it. So I'm flattered that y'all are here, but uh, y'all need to know this gentleman, and you need to reach into your checkbooks, too, because what's being done down there, I've seen it now firsthand. Uh, it just, uh, ooh, I, it can, I stood at the door of her bedroom, and like a lot of people, got a little misty-eyed and uh, a little weak-kneed at where uh, some of the gr world's greatest literature was written in that room. Thank you for golf today. Um, we are here to talk about our books and to answer questions. Let me talk about the edict. Is that okay? Sure, that's great. I'd love to, actually. Uh, not because I want to hear myself talking, but there, it's, it's been a, uh, an amazing last couple of months that there are two people who live, in you in Atlanta, me in Alpharetta, but in the Atlanta area who have published golf novels. And I have never met Bob, but I was in the golf business for a long time in another end of the golf business, actually promoting people like Bob. And when I first, you know, like a lot of you, I research and, you know, see what's publication dates. And I'm just, and I saw this book and I'm like, Bob Cup, okay, okay. And I went through all the courses I played of Bob's and how he destroyed my life and made me change to, to tennis. And uh, then I got the book. And I'll hear, this is interesting to hear for an author. Uh, I made it very aware to him that I read the book twice, and I was honored and I was glad to do it. He said, why'd you read it twice? Well, you read it twice, Bob, because it's a good book, and you want to make sure you've got it. That what affected you originally, you got, and it enhances the pleasure of reading. I would imagine everybody in this amphitheater loves to crack open a book. I've never downloaded a book in my life, printed out, except my own manuscripts, but to, to get in that certain chair with a certain cigar or whatever and crack that book open and read it, the frontispieces, just all the stuff, it means so much to me. And I did it twice because also I, I loved it the first time and I wanted to write a review like a lot of people do, throw it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Powell's, whatever, and give tribute to my, my new good friend here. And I did. I read it twice because I wanted to the second time to make absolutely sure and maybe like a lot of you who have read the edict, I'm looking closely thinking, wow, that, that's actually this artist over here. That's Jack Nicholas, or maybe that's Arnold Palmer, and it is. And then he, on the 18th green today, he said, well, you know who Etta is. And I'm thinking about the beautiful naked Etta, you know, bathing in a pond in February there in Scotland. And I said, uh, okay, I know, the, I know the page. I know it, and it, she has a sort of a gypsy-like quality. And he declared to me who it actually is, and this is a real live living person, and she's an, uh, a musical artist, and I just was, it just enriched me more about this special book. Now, I'm telling you, he, I don't think he gets it, but those of us who read heavily, and you do too, I know, first novel, Kadav. That is a remarkable achievement. Uh, I, I just am so proud of you, and and how it got to Kanaf and they publish, as we were talking today, they publish handsome books. Their books look good. The, the, the type styles that they use look good. It all makes sense. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the front flap and the back flap and the, the photographs that they choose of their authors, which his, was his uh, brother, uh, uh, just a highly regarded professional photographer. 
Anyway, I say these things sincerely. I am not afraid to tell people I am proud of them, that I enjoyed another artist's work. Not to produce any other compliments from the other side, but I'm just telling you, you're here because you want to know about Bob and the edict and tournament and us more, but I'm here to tell you, here is another author sincerely and deeply saying, I love this book and it is unique. His hand is in it. The drawings, the, and I thought what you did good, uh, oh, sorry, did well. Uh, the dialect was just enough. I bet you it probably could have been like when you read the edict, at the actual edict at the end right. of the book. Okay, now that's, that's like reading, you know, Vietnamese, baby. <laughs> but I'm working through it, and I read that more than twice. But I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, uh, the, the use of the dialect, where appropriate, this omniscient narrator was also an instructor. You just learned so many things in the book. And, uh, I'm proud to, to know you mm -hmm. and to have seen this book a few months ago thinking, okay, wow, this has got to be good. Knopf, first novel, Bob Cup, and uh, pretty amazing. But here's a guy who makes golf courses. Forest land. You clear trees, you go up in a helicopter, look at topographical maps, right? You know. I don't like to clear the trees, well, and I hate helicopters. <laughs> but just an amazing book. Now, for those of you who have read it, I see you nodding. I'm seeing, you know, we see y'all out there. I see you nodding, and for those of you who have not read it, uh, I know you will after tonight, uh, if we're convincing enough, certainly. It is, it is really amazing. It is not too long. It's not too short. Um, and I told Bob, and I'll, I'll quit talking here, but uh, I, I, I read the book, and I got to a certain part, and I was at a book signing for Tuneman at a border store in uh, Johns Creek, Georgia, you know, up the street. And, you know, all the people had passed. They'd had enough of me. And I'm looking around. I'm thinking, God, well, you know, what do you do for the next two and a half hours? <laughs> you know, I ain't signing many books. Uh, everybody's kind of gone. And I saw the edict over there, so I made sure my hands were clean. And, you know, I didn't take it into the commode with me. So I sat there, and I, I, re I finished the rest of the book. <laughs> You know, while people were, were sort of milling around, and uh, it was a good, and then read it again, just again to make sure. So I brought along that review to read if you want me to, but you, uh, you say something real quick. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I, uh, and I read Tuneman. I wasn't sure what I was going to get into. There's a genre of, of books about the golf industry that have been going on since it's about 20 to 25 years. A gentleman named Dan Jenkins, who wrote for Sports Illustrated for years and years, wrote a book called Dead Solid Perfect and two or three other things. And he had a very, <clears throat> I don't want to call it Saturday Night Live sort of mentality, but the kind of thing that you, humor that you don't expect. And humor that goes to the absolute edge of, well, goes beyond reality, but certainly goes to the edge of comprehension. And uh, the other ones were uh, Rick Riley, who always has a, a little column in the back of Sports Illustrated, wrote a book called Missing Links. That's a treasure. And then just a little bit later, one of the ex-tour players, I think who has since been diagnosed as bipolar or something, uh, is a guy named David Faraday, an Irishman, who interestingly enough wrote a book about a home-and-home -home match that went on between a Scottish club and an English club. Now, an Irishman has the perfect position to write such a book, and it was as bizarre as you could ever imagine. But there is a guffaw on every page. Then I picked up Tuneman. It fits perfectly in that category and it has the most absolutely delightful way of presenting golf and the surroundings of golf that gets completely around golf's greatest illness. Golf's big illness is ego. People get way, way too serious about themselves and their games. And this is not what the game's about. The game's about having fun. Well, this is an individual in the book, Wayman Poodle, we've already mentioned his name, which I could barely read without giggling when it first started, and then to find out that his boss was, I'd never heard of anybody named Wayman, 
His boss's name was Wayman. <laughs> but where did that come from? <clears throat> and Wayman Poodle was the best at his job of anybody in an entire bank that covered five states. He was a teller. And he liked to be a teller. And he was finally recognized as being the best teller in the bank and, you know, it was great. But Wayman's secret desire was to play Augusta National. He ended up volunteering as a, uh, he ended up applying for a volunteer position. One thing led to another as the story came together into the most just unbelievably hilarious series of events, things that happened, what people said, the way things were stated, that Wayman Poodle, who at the end of the day, in spite of the fact that he's been lampooned for how many pages? 200 and something? <laughs> <coughs> he comes away being an honorable hero. Now, not just anybody can pull that off. Now, having played golf with Todd, I can see how he could pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wayman Poodle eventually does have this opportunity. And in order to get there, he has to battle through his own emotional uh, fear of wasps. And in this instance, it's not just a wasp, it's something about the size of a crow which devours people and then, and, and, you know, he's created all of these things. And unfortunately, this wasps, the only ones that are known exist on the 12th tee at Augusta National. And you know what's coming in the book. So his, his ability, Todd's ability to set up the line, to set up the story, to know what you look down the road in this book and you say, uh-oh, now he's going to play. He gets his chance to play because he's, his, his ultimate boss, the president of the bank, is a member at Augusta National and this sort of thing. Well, it, it is an incredible story that leads you down a path that you think, you know that this could really happen. I mean, it's pretty slim, but it could happen. But what I liked the most, honestly, is that he's still sitting here. <clears throat> that is to say, Todd is still sitting here, and that the Augusta police have not <laughs> showed up. This, you know, Augusta National, especially here in Georgia, I mean, Georgia's very proud of Augusta, should be. The tournament of Bob Jones, of all of the, the, the history that golfers sometimes get a little misty about, which is okay. But Augusta is talked about more in golf annals as a cathedral, as a mystical place, all of this stuff. Well, I can tell you, having been there in July and worked there for 10 years, it's just dirt. It's got grass on it, and in the summertime, it doesn't look all that great. But in the springtime, for that two weeks when the Azaleas come out, and the Jack Nicholases of the world, and the Tiger Woodses, and the Arnold Palmers, and any other mystical character you want to talk about is stalking those slopes, being watched, by the way, by the ghost of Bob Jones. It's pretty special. But unfortunately, that's not the case in Todd's book. What he does. With probably, I'm not sure that he knows this, but <laughs> oh. he has undressed the real Augusta. Everything in the book is believable. Though the people might not talk like that in public, at some point, they're just people. And the things they said and the way they went about it and their own personal egos and so on and so forth is not that far off the mark. So I, you know, and, and in my mind, for somebody who is not a member there, of course, if he was a member, he wouldn't be a member anymore. That's an automatic. <laughs> <clears throat> but that he got it. 
And you know, if there's anything wrong in the golf business, as I said a few minutes ago, it's, it's ego. People having the wrong attitude about why they even play the game. And I can tell you that the members at Augusta, and there are no bunches of them, are members there mostly because they love to play golf. That's a good thing. And in many ways, Augusta is very pure. The players are there not because of their own ego, because most of them have enough money that they can make it on in from here. But they're there because they like to play golf and they like to hang out with each other and it's a private club and they can do whatever they want to go back to the Hootie Johnson, Martha Burke program back a couple of years. But Todd's book, along with this magical Wayman Poodle character, have managed to make a great read for people not just that know golf or love golf, but for people that not only don't know golf, but maybe even people who hate golf. That's important. It, what I'm saying is it's a good read. It's a fun read. It's the kind of thing that that when you start reading it, you're not going to want to quit because it's different than anything you've ever seen. And it is great fun. So I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I, I really mean it. It does mean a lot to hear people who have deeply read your book talk about it. There's no doubt about it. I would like to say, though, that I have known three real live Waymans in my life. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. One is uh, is a is a, a fellow just a little bit younger than me. He's from, well, Seneca, South Carolina. So, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, his name is Wayman. Goes by Mitch. <laughs> his father is, his name is Wayman. And when I was growing up, my parents' best friends, and uh, he has uh, passed away, unfortunately. He was a great guy. His name was Wayman Hinton. Grew up in Smyrna, Georgia, and my parents knew him very well. And he went for somebody, my parents still can't explain why he went by the name of Cuz. But old Cuz, we'd go down to Callaway Gardens and when I was a kid and play golf all the time and Cuz this and Cuz that. And he was just real snappy and uh, <coughs> just a great personality. But three Waymans, maybe. Y'all know other Waymans, and that name has just always stuck with me. And, uh, you know, any author will maybe tell you or not tell you how they came up with character characteristics and why they did that and how they named their characters. And it's simply a lot of times because they like the sound of that name, and it'll keep them interested. I'll tell you a little bit of, you know, maybe y'all have questions about the writing line, <coughs> but it, to keep you interested in that character, if his name was... You know. John. Okay. There's probably a John in the audience, but with all due respect. Wayman, and obviously I, I attempted to write a, a book that was highly and obviously allegorical. I admit it. The publisher knows it. I said, you know, his name's Poodle because he's a show dog. He is showy. He is alien-like. I've always loved the name Wayman. They didn't have a problem with it, but that's uh, uh, there are people out there matriculating within our society uh, named Wayman. You just... Back off, leave them alone. Okay, <laughs> most of them are good people, but you never know if there might be. I won't any, mention it any, again. That's okay. <clears throat> it may be, but uh, uh, you know, when we were children, there are people that are your parents' age that you like, you know, like uncles and family friends that talk to you in a different way. And, uh, I did that for Cuz, for Wayman, and uh, unfortunately, we're not related anymore. But a former brother-in-law of mine, who I just love deeply, had like today had one of just the funnest just rounds of golf with him one day um, in Myrtle Beach years ago, just me and Mitch, and I got to know my brother-in-law then that day and how sweet a guy. There are men out there who are just sweet and nice and sincere, and uh, he was very flattered, and I said, well, partly because your name's Wayman, too, because I love you so much, and you're a good guy, and uh, but I just think that name's funny. But I think, you know, you'll and maybe, obviously, with Carol and and, and, and Etta and others, uh, uh, Mordiac, Domney, hmm. uh, you'll have to explain. But I think a writer, especially when you're going to do something very farcical, very lampooning, you want to keep people's attention, you want to go a little overboard. You know, I don't. am I an expert? I don't know. Uh, a publisher and an audience thinks it's funny. Well, and I do too. I think if you're going to go over the top and almost write a surreal form of comic fiction, you want to go for it. I went for it. I just, I felt that it, you know, and it, it, it got some attention. And I'm just 
deeply appreciative of that. I really am. But I deliberately tried to make it wacky. And I'll tell you a little bit, and I'll hand it back over to Bob. The editor that I was assigned uh, never met him, by the way. You know, we just phone calls, emails, uh, but it's still very intimate. The tone of the emails, just the salutations. You get really pretty tight with the person. We were talking today, you want that word or you want that word? Page 62 on the galley, line 3, you want that or which? Your call, blah, blah, blah. This one scene, though, Todd, we think is just a little way over the top. Now, we're okay with it, but do you want to make, you know, the fart flame eight feet or six feet? Now, it's your call. You know, you're the expert on people who like farts. And I said, well, you know, I've seen it done. I've done it myself. Teaching my sons. They're, they're, you know, eight feet. I don't know. You know, it's six feet better. And I, I had to make a call there, you know, but you're talking about deliberate comic over-the-top fiction. Did you mention that it was on fire? <laughs> <laughs> well, they knew it. And uh, But to hear your editor, these people, and, and maybe you've been there or getting there, and I hope you do. I, I do. It's the most unbelievable professional experience you will ever have in your life, literally and professionally, when you work with an editor. Guess what? It's like your child's doctor. <laughs> That's about the best analogy I can give you they know where the freckle is. They know that he likes the left cheek as opposed to the right cheek with that injection. And this is a person who knows your book probably better than you do. Uh, that may be profound to say, but it's true. Oh, yeah, I did that. You forget. You know, you forget. But Wayman's and uh, why I named his bank manager Wayman, because I thought it would be funny. It's as simple as that. And it is. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just never forget. I'll just name him Wayman too, but I'll make him an opposite character. And I think in a lot of comic writing, especially kind of surreal, over the top, uh, if I was instructing a class, I would say get two people who are completely different from each other or completely or than each other. Anyway, in the same room and shut the door and let them go at it. The comic possibilities and elements in doing that are un, uh, really unlimited. Now, it's tough in golf because, you know, three to four people play golf, and then you have caddies. Very difficult to make sure you're covering everybody. Uh, but if you have two people and they're complete opposites of each other, or they're suspicious of each other, or they do not like each other, the comic elements, and, and the dramatic elements, too, are great. But you'll see, if you'll notice in a lot of books, a lot of times in dialogue and in scenes, there are only two people. Most of the time, you know, a lot of times there's three, but good writers, if you can pull off four or five people talking at the same time and keep your interest, it's probably going to be very short. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, get two people in a room or in a situation who are very different from each other, whether they're both of their names are Wayman or not, uh, and you can, you can have some fun. You can have some fun. And that was done deliberately. You know, these are all techniques, and you'll read about this and maybe get instructed at seminars about it. Do it. You know, don't get too misty-eyed about the process. Just, you know, this works. But let it work in your own voice. Well. Uh, we had, Bob, we had a hand, our first hand raise. Right, let's have it. You, okay. Oh, go Go ahead. for it. You want, okay. All right. We'll do. I'll tell you what. Let me do first. Let me read my tribute. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, men go and play golf together and bond. And I... I've known, Bob, known of Bob for many years, and uh, he's designed courses that competed with clubs, in, you know, to a degree that I sold, if you will, and, and, and promoted. But again, when I first started seeing, you know, photo not available, the Edict Bob Cup, and I'd read a little bit, wow, I can't wait to get this. I mean, I really was excited to get it. Let me, uh, let me read what I wrote about and threw on the Internet. It's out there for all to enjoy. Um, I, and I really want to make sure that, Everybody knows that other authors, there, there's, you'd be surprised. I, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not a jealous person. And if I see something I like, I, I will, I'll go after it and I'll tell the world about it. Methinks this is a Bonnie book. <laughs> Edicts are meant to be broken and a novel about how golf might have began, got stopped and begun again. Was meant to be written by a real live golf course maker, writer, artist, social observer, and bon vivant. <laughs> Bob Cup, who's designed fairways and fair greens all over the earth, has published a novel so deep in historical fact 
and usable information that it's enjoyable on loads of levels. In other words, do you know why we play golf with a hole? Really? You know, sausages are linked, some crimes are linked, but finally we get the explanation from a man who knows. Cup's narrator tells us in golf what links really means. Cup's narrator gives us a review of grasses and a review of ancient equipment. The edict, you get the best golf lessons. All you have to do is crack this handsome book open and start grinning. The story is about a young shepherd, Carol Patterson, who's a natural golfer and plays in matches here and there, governed by the United Golf Honor Society against golfers who make cameo appearances under ancient names and descriptions. Cup pays quirky tributes to memorable characters, very much like Nicholas, Hagen, Hogan, Palmer, Sneed, and Jones. Carol's handsomely crafted, too. But there's always got to be a jealous character lurking around to make the story even more interesting and violent. And it's the local moneylender and outright grumpy fart, Mordiac Domini. <laughs> In Carol's quest to win the championship, goons get ventilated with arrows and gutted with knives. A local Bonnie gal, Etta, bears it all in hopes of distracting our hero, and it damn well works. <laughs> and the most unlikely creeps turn into real gentlemen, all because of this pesky score, sport called golf. Look closely in the edict, literally, look closely, and also enjoy something unique to any modern golf novel. Cup's own drawings accentuate the entire book. Who is that modern golfer in ancient leggings on one of the early pages, VII? Could that be the great golfer from Latrobe on page 63, sporting a bushy beard? Could be. Sure is. And that's part of the fun of this book. The author's clever hand and mind is all over and in the pages. The Edict is a novel. It's fictional entertainment, but it's a truthful book. You can feel the affection the author has for the sport and the towns and topography on which we play it. And you can feel the affection for how he thinks golf might have started 600 or so years ago. I say let's make a new edict up. Let's make this special book the official golfer's Bible. In the King James Version, we're supposed to believe a dead man can come alive. Then let's believe a simple man, a humble shepherd, can play golf a lot and that his woman will still love him too. And who's to say their children became the famous ancient club makers and golf professionals we learn about in coffee table books, those old gray beards whose old photographs we gaze at and wonder if they really knew what golf would become. I say let's propose that idea of cups too. I won't cry it down. There you go. Wow. <laughs> well, then I'll read a little yeah, passage, read a little. and then right. you, you look up something that okay. you... Okay, you got it. One of the problems with historic novels is, if you've read Edward Rutherford, uh, his many, many wonderful books, London and Sarum and the Forest and the Princes of Ireland and the Rebels of Ireland, is that he had a very unique way of preserving his characters over, say, the 2,000 years of the historical sequence of the book London. Amazing stuff. And his way of preserving characters was to pick out a physical trait. One of them was an individual with that little white streak of hair that you see sometimes. Another one was a particular kind of hand and various and sundry other traits. And those people would continually reemerge in his stories. So it was a very fascinating way to do it, but great, great storytelling. And here I have this, this historical novel and one of the really problematic parts of a historical novel is your, your characters keep dying off. <laughs> and I wanted a way to incorporate hundreds, if not thousand years, by keeping the same characters. And I did that by creating one that was a storyteller. Um, I don't know whether you've ever read any of Daniel Borston's work, the guy that once upon a time was the curator for the National Archives, and he, does, he has one called The Discoverers, and it talks at the end about intelligence and what is intelligence and so on and so forth. And intelligence in that era, in this era, it turns out, was that which you could remember. Nothing was written in books. It was before the Augsburg Press. It was before 
for the Gutenberg Press. It, it was a time when people had to remember. And the Greeks, of course, were at the very outset of that. So these people had a different way of recalling, and one of them was by storytellers. And this is a Scottish trait that I know to be. I don't know if it happens to be worldwide, but certainly in Scotland, thanks to some of the numerous people who have been gracious in sort of sharing their knowledge, I created this character. His name is Angus, which is a completely, almost mortally Scotland, Scottish <laughs> name, <laughs> Angus Gillicopane. And he is the basically the architect, if you will, of the golf courses that they played. But all he did was to go out into the links and wander around and find places where these wonderful players could exercise their shots, could, could hit challenging uh, shots and, and try to beat one another and make an exciting go of it. And his entire thing was simply to find these places and go to the patch of grass that the sheep had just gnawed down to fine, fine leather, nice, soft, smooth, half-inch length, and cut a hole. That was the entirety of his construction, cutting a hole. But he was the person who would go to a particular little tavern in St. Andrews when they had finally settled that that was the place to be because the links were so good. I mean, there's something really interesting about the links as far as golf is concerned, and I probably will, will read some of that, but Gilly Copain told stories about golf, and he, he was the center of attention when all the players would go there to have a drink each night that the event was going on. In one instance, um, he talked about the very, very beginnings of the game. And uh, the beginning of this thing talks about the little, it's called Tippin's Bar. The rafters of the low ceiling were logs stripped of their bark, and numerous oil lamps cast a golden hue throughout the small room. The bar itself was a highly polished slab of oak, nearly a yard wide and some 15 feet long with a slight curve. Tippin valued the width above the straightness, but had rounded and smoothed the edges to spare his patrons of the splinters. Tonight the house was full, some standing at the bar, others sitting at small tables on shorter stools or the odd chair. The room was aglow with the dim golden light. After some idle conversation about the day's matches, one of the eight finalists, Samson McLeod, from distant Applecross Forest in the West Highlands, asked a favor of Gilly Copain concerning the beginnings of the game. For what it's worth, Samson McLeod was Sam Snead, and his personage is modeled after Sam Snead, whom I was fortunate to get to know and do some golf courses with him. And he said what Sam said. I mean, it's, it's the characters there. Mm -hmm. It was really fun to do that because otherwise I would have been racking my brain on how to create all these players when they already existed. Anyway, he says, would you tell it again? There's many a new ear to hear and the old ones would welcome it too, the beginning of the game. Silent anticipation filled the room. Frowning slightly, Angus reminded everyone the story was only that, just a story. Then raising his eyebrows and looking down, he said, or is it? I, I can't do the Scottish brogue, by the way. At once, all attention was fixed on him. It's a place we all know well, in the links, maybe these right here at St. Andrews. But you know, it's hardly likely anyone just up and invented golf. It's a game so simple and natural that it gradually came about on its own. Maybe it was a shepherd like Samson here or Patterson, monitoring, motioning to a suddenly beaming carol, tending his sheep when he chanced on a round pebble. And having his crook in his hand, he struck it away. Gilly Copain made a short, fierce swing from his stool, for it is inevitable that a man or a lad with a stick in his hand should aim a blow at any loose object lying in his path as natural 
as that he should breathe. There were chuckles around the room. On pastures green this led to naught, but in the lynx land, once upon a time, probably that shepherd rolled one of those stones into a rabbit scrape. Mary, he quoth, I couldn't do that if I tried. It was a thought so instinctive to his ambition that nerved him to the attempt in the first place. But nay man nor lad will long persevere alone in any arduous task. So our shepherd hailed another who was hard by to witness this endeavor, who said, Forsooth, tis easy. And trying, after a moment's hesitation, he failed. The stories that he told make the evolution of the game comprehensible. And this was one of the first ones. And the subjects that he addressed were simply an, a categorization of the game. What it is, how it is. And Todd mentioned the whole itself. And maybe I can find that passage to read it to you because I never really thought about that. Have, have you ever pitched pennies against the wall? And who won was who could pitch it the closest to the wall without... Sometimes it was very close, and then they argued. They always argued. But when there's a hole, the ball drops out of sight. And when you extend that to the implications of the hole, it gets a little heavy, and maybe I can find it and read it to you. At any rate, making these elements come together, what they were hitting the reason they didn't want to hit it into a rabbit scrape to start with because they'd lose their good stone or their ball or anything like that, it was gone. So they were playing close and the game, the way I saw it, could have failed. Then there was another version of how it got into the air, which included a momentous battle between the some invaders from the South, Anglo-Saxons, that actually happened. And it had so much detail about this particular battle that I was able to say that historically it was actually finished at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on May the 17th or 18th or whatever it was in 385, <laughs> way, way back. And when I was finished with all of this stuff, I asked a good friend of mine who, who's a general manager at St. Andrews, the golf operation, and he suggested that I go to a guy named W.W. W. Knox, who's the chairman of the history department at St. Andrews. They had just finished, and I knew who he was because I had his book. He had the penultimate history of Scotland by Penguin. And uh, it was unbelievable. And I, I, wrote, <laughs> I wrote to Bill and I said, you could certainly come highly recommended. And I was wondering if you would have a, uh, an, a graduate assistant who would be willing to take on a project of reviewing doing a disaster check of the historical aspects of this novel. And he said, he wrote me back and he said, yes, I, I, I do have someone and I will approach them. And by the way, how much are you offering? And so I told him. And three days later, I got another email from him. And he said, I'm very sorry to tell you that the graduate student that I had in mind is unfortunately on location doing some research. However, don't despair. <laughs> I'll do the research for you. So I guess I had quoted enough money that I, the chairman of the history department was going to come for it. And I was, I was so amused at his Scottishness on the whole thing. But then he read the whole book. And I had sent him a highlighted copy. You know, here are the, the items that I, I really need some, some confirmation on. That sort of thing went into the book. I was amazed at his response, at his, well, I wasn't amazed at his knowledge because he, he gave me some tremendous ideas and confirmations and so on and so forth. But it ended up at the end of, when we finally had it ready to go into press, and I had asked the editor, what do I do with all of the, the uh, you know, my source books? He said, well, I don't think I've ever seen a novel 
with a bibliography. <laughs> but there it is. And, and I put it in there more because I wanted other people to go to those books. They're, some of them are just amazing, wonderful things. And I, my trip through Scottish history, which, which lasted a long, long time because I started on it, you know, just thinking about it back even in the days when my father used to read to us, my brother and I, before, this is BT, as it's called, before television. Um, <laughs> he would read to my brother and I, I'd read Dickens and Keats and other things, but sometimes he would read about people who invented games. And I didn't know it at the time, but I guess that's when I slipped into empathy that I knew I wanted to do that because the game, I knew about Doubleday, I knew about Naismith, I knew about Wingfield and tennis, and he, would, he was interested in that, but there was never an inventor for golf. Golf just was. And it turns out that there is a way to state. That's what troubled me. That's what bothered me about all this, that there's no comprehensive understanding of what, not what did happen, but what might have happened. And I've had so many people with just wonderful backgrounds and, and historically oriented people come and say, there is no reason for anybody to say it might not have happened that way because of so and so. And having those people going to them and saying, look, I don't know this, can you help me with it? And they would. Uh, it was almost like a communal project in the golf business, but it culminated many, many years of wondering what happened. And the opportunity, being a reader, the opportunity to finally put some of that, I don't, I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to call it prose, but certainly words into order that would bring some sense to it and at the same time tell a story, it was a great thrill. And I am a rookie at this, I'd even go so far as to say I'm an amateur at this. I mean, I have a day job, <laughs> and I enjoy my day job. But I became so enamored with the idea that nobody's ever done this, and that's exactly what Random House or Knopf said. This is unlike anything that was ever done, and you're probably crazy, but we like the idea, and we're going to go with it. And being able to portray it was great fun. And then having Nicholas come back and say, you know what? I'll write the foreword for that book. And Arnold Palmer putting a blurb on the back along with a lot of other people was kind of a confirmation of my entire life. So I think maybe, you know, my, my, literary, uh, my literary life might be over, but unless I get some kind of brainstorm to write something else. In the meantime, I'll just keep along doing my day job. Anyway, are you going to read something? Oh, I'll be happy to. Let's hear that for Bob. That's good stuff. Well, again, I've said before, you know, y'all are here to, you know, God forbid to hear from us, but you love to read good books and maybe you want to write one yourself or maybe you're, you're doing it, you know, you're writing it. Maybe it's done whatever stage it's in. But Bob's right. You have a story to tell. And the key word in that phrase is you. You're going to tell a different story about a man and a woman, you know, in some mystery in Europe or whatever, than, you know, than she will or he will. The key thing is you. You're going to tell it. You're going to tell this story. Now, some other novelist, whether golf, you know, uh, aficionado or not, is going to tell, you know, the fictional beginnings of, the, uh, of golf. He or she's going to tell it in a little bit different way, use different characters. But you have a story to tell. And uh, that meant a lot to me because you, you do. You, you, it's all you're thinking about. It is amazing that the other chores around the house get done, but you have a story to tell, and you're not going to give up on it until it's done, okay, and then edited, and then sent off to literary agents and hopefully publishers. So <laughs> that's real key. You've got a story to tell. It's very, very important to never give up on that. And you did it. Uh, I'll be happy to read from Tournament of Champions. Uh, let me read something Christian-like here. <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, this is from page 22. Uh, the book is about, I'll tell you what it's about. On a surface level, novels are about da-da-da, what happens. 
This is just called plot or the storyline. Uh, being around golf and in the, the, the business for a long time myself, I finally came to the, the, the realization that uh, women too, mostly men, however, cannot think that their lives will be satisfactory forever and ever unless they play Augusta National Golf Club one time. I have never played it. I've been there as a reporter. Uh, I've been there as a patron. But I've never played it, and I know why people want to play it. History, the, the social aspects of this place, everything that's gone on. Um, to play it. I know people that have played it. Uh, very important people that, you know, were knocking their knees on the first tee because of the importance of the history and what it meant to them. Okay, and that's fine. This guy, Wayman, has uh, certain uh, interesting and alien-like qualities, and his, he, this book is about obsession, uh, uh, and that's something that I know about, so I'll write that story. Uh, it is ultimately about, however, tokenism. Uh, Hopefully, as a social observer, I don't do a whole lot of blogging and write newspaper articles, but I have opinions of the way we lead our lives professionally and socially, and I don't voice them very often, but I, I feel that I'm a fair person, and uh, I watch society at work, as we all do, and form my opinions and think for myself. And there are just certain things that I've always felt that, you know, fairness is important, uh, sex, color of skin, all of those are very important to me. They really are. I sit back and I think about them. Uh, I, I am sympathetic. Uh, I'm hopefully valiant at times uh, about it. But it, it's ultimately about tokenism and the work that other people do so hard within the law. You know, I tell my sons all the time now, you know, if you're going to do something weird, that's weird, but is it you know, within the law, is it is it ethical? There, there's your guideline. And what clubs do and, and exclusive clubs or inclusive clubs or whatever, they are within the law. And the social aspects of that are, to me, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Even since I was a kid, I, I, I sensed all this stuff. But all these men of Augusta National or all the men of Goat Hills Country Club or whatever, they work hard, spend money, get money from other people to do things, and then all of a sudden... Somebody who just kind of floats in. Well, it's part of what Tournament of Champions is about. Did the person do anything to deserve it? I don't know. I think that's a very powerful social conundrum. This is from the early part of the book, which, uh, and I'll explain, kind of crystallizes Wayman's obsession. Wayman Poodle of Mullet Love, Georgia, suffering from something, of course, Wayman had thought many times of how his life would turn out if he never got to play golf at Augusta National Golf Club, and this was a horrifying thought. The thought made his brain squirm, made his heart race, his lungs suck for air. Wayman's dreams nearly every night thoroughly dealt with this topic in multicolor. All this makes him a little self-absorbed, Wayman. In other words, in Wayman's mind, there are two distinctly different types of people in the world. Those who have played Augusta National Golf Club and those who have not played Augusta National Golf Club. In a hazy, faraway place where screams echo, Wayman saw the two groups float around in monstrous hordes, dressed in white robes, naked underneath, but wearing footjoy golf shoes with soft spikes. And the ones who had played Augusta National Golf Club had satisfied expressions on their face and joyed lives that were finally worth living. Now they went forth and prospered and finally cured all the people in the world who had colon polyps. The ones who had not played Augusta National Golf Club spewed things from out of their mouths that were not nice. These horrifying people drooled and giggled and screamed and reached through the clouds and touched each other's private parts with their fingers and lips <laughs> and allowed giant cicada killer wasps to crawl around on their hands and up their arms and up their necks and onto their faces without even trying to knock them off, not one bit. <laughs> so Wayman prayed, mantra style, for 59 seconds of each minute that the Lord God Jesus would see fit to place his name on the Augusta National Golf Club tee sheet and on a guest list with the guard in the guardhouse on Washington Road. Wayman asked the Lord God Jesus to drive him through the gate after the guard saluted him and told him, Mr. Wayman Poodle of Mullet Love, how nice it was to have him as a guest today and hopefully many times in the future. Wayman then, with the Lord God Jesus' assistance, would drive slowly, reverently, 
desperately trying not to run over all those weird-looking magnolia pine cone things on the asphalt of Magnolia Lane, then into the locker room to lunch in the men's grill, into the pro shop to say hello and to thank them and to buy 17 logoed shirts onto the practice range, then onto the first tee of tea olive. Amen. <laughs> Corner. <laughs> Oh my word! Poor, poor well, Wayman. I tell you what, let's let's do let's just do. Oh gosh, yeah. Sure. All right, let's let's do that. Sure. Questions? If there are any questions. <laughs> Does anybody have After all that. I don't see any questions. Oh, there's one. Yeah. No. No, golf in the kingdom is a is a vehicle for selling Eastern religions, but it is indeed a, a great read. I, I enjoyed Michael Murphy's work. Uh, there even was a cult organization that it, that it emanated from yeah. his work, from his books. But no, it is not. This is purely historic, and it doesn't get into mysticism even, ex well, with the exception of the mystical nature of a golf ball rolling across the grass. But no, it's not that at all. It's purely historic in nature. The people that are in it at the, at the highest level are factual. King James, Stuart, King 